Thank you very much. And uh, um, I will try to discuss uh, uh, this issue from a little bit different point of view. So do we really need, or uh, which are the problems that we have related to transpulmonary pressure? So no conflict of interest for me. And you know, esophageal pressure monitoring is becoming more and more popular, and many, many ventilators are uh, going to uh, uh, introduce these measurements uh, uh, in uh, their device. But if you look at the recent data from the lung safe, less than 1% of mechanical ventilated patients are monitored by using uh, esophageal pressure and transpulmonary pressure. So we like physiology, but now we have to discuss if we really need this technique. So as you see, we, uh, the application of esophageal pressure measurements and transformative pressure measurements uh, uh, is, a, is a, a different application from passive to spontaneous mechanical ventilation. And uh, one of the most important applications in RDS, as mentioned is before, is that it can give us more information on how to optimize protective mechanical ventilation, reaching a inspiratory transformary pressure not higher than 15 to 20 centimeters of water, which is equivalent to around 25, 27 centimeters of water in the airways. Uh, we know that we have to limit the driving transformary pressure uh, below 10 to 15 maximum centimeter of water, and also transformary pressure may be useful to better select the PIP strategies and the PIP um, level and recruitment uh, pressure. And this is a recent paper from an intensive care medicine discussing the technique uh, of measuring esophageal pressure and transpulmonary pressure. So we are looking at the technique, but we are not looking at uh, uh, which real information we can get from these measurements. So first of all, I will discuss the type of catheter and inflation. As you know, we have to insert a catheter in the esophagus, and the pressure that we measure is around here. So uh, below the heart, at least in supine position. So we have two problems here, that the pressure that we measure with an esophageal balloon uh, is depending from the compliance of the balloon and the compliance of the esophagus. Secondly, it may be also affected by the weight of the heart in supine position. And also, if you look at different uh, types of esophageal balloons commercially available, and here you have the uh, inflation volume, and uh, this is the pressure, uh, and these are different pressure outside the balloon, so when you increase, for example, uh, the level of PEEP. And you see here the different balloons, they need a different level of inflation volume in order to reach a flat pressure volume curve of the balloon. So it means that different balloons require different inflation volume to have an accurate uh, measurements of the pressure, which is one technical problem. The other technical problem is that the amount of inflation in order to reach a flat pressure in the pressure volume curve of the, of the balloon, it depends and increases when you increase the PIP. So the accuracy of the measurement is not always uh, uh, reached uh, from a technical point of view. And also, it's not very easy uh, at the bedside to get the measurement of transpulmonary or esophageal pressure. And you can see here you have different device or just from outside the, uh, the, the ventilator or now some of them, they include these measurements within the monitor of the ventilator. The positioning and validation test, this is a, a, a review that we published a few years ago. Uh, uh, showing the technique of uh, uh, positioning of the balloon. I don't want to enter here into the details, but that to show here that the esophageal, uh, mm, the esophageal pressure measurements may be markedly affected uh, by the cardiac artifacts. So it's not very easy to measure an uh, individual value of esophageal pressure because sometimes with very high uh, cardiac artifacts, and this may be up to three to four centimeters of water, which may make a major impact uh, in the real measurements of transpulmonary pressure. 
Further, there are two methods in order to validate uh, the pressure, which are the so-called uh, uh, um, uh, occlusion techniques. This is in patients with inspiratory efforts, so in spontaneous or assisted ventilation. You occlude the airways, which is not easy to do with the modern ventilator. So it's, you have no knobs to occlude the airways at end expiration, for example, during pressure support in many ventilators, actually. They were in the old ventilators, but not actually for safety reason. And when you have this kind of inspiratory effort at occlusion, you would expect that the changes in the airway pressure follow exactly the changes in the esophageal pressure. So the transpulmonary pressure at end occlusion, so no hair inflating, the, the, no gas inflating the lung, the transpulmonary pressure is around zero. And you have a perfect uh, relationship between esophageal pressure and uh, airway pressure swings. And the same can be done in patients without inspiratory effort. So you close the arrays. This may be done with the ventilator. You gently push on the thorax so with the arrays occluded, and you artificially increase the pressure in the uh, thorax and in the esophageal, uh, esophagus. And again, you look at the, at the relationship between the changes in the esophageal pressure and the airway pressure. This is more theoretical than in practice. And so in at least 40 to 50% of the cases, it, we are not able to reach such a, an agreement between the changes in the esophageal pressure and the changes in the airway pressure at occlusion. What the esophageal pressure really measure? In order to get this information, uh, we did several studies by putting this kind of uh, uh, pressure transducers within the thorax, of course, in animal experiments, in order to compare regional pleural pressure with the esophageal pressure. And these are uh, just from recent study that we completed in Dresden in uh, the physiology laboratory of Professor Abreu. And these are studies uh, from a few years, uh, some, some years ago, when we showed that the pressure uh, um, underlying the most dependent part of the lung in the RDS may reach up to 10 centimeters of water. So the pressure from non-dependent to the dependent lung in RDS is up to 10 centimeters of water, squeezing the most dependent of the lung. That's why we have atelectasis mainly in the most dependent part of the lung. And the pressure, regional pressure gradient is come from minus 2 to 3 uh, in the upper part, up to 5 plus 5 plus seven in the most dependent part of the lung. Just, just to show you that there is a vertical gradient in the pleural pressure gradient. So the real pleural pressure is different from non-dependent to the dependent lung regions. While you measure only one pressure with the esophageal pressure. And in fact, when we compare the pleural pressure and the esophageal pressure measurement at end expiration in the dependent part of the lung and the non-dependent part of the lung, as you can see here, there is not a good correlation between the level of measurement of esophageal pressure and the pleural pressure. As you can see here, in the non-dependent region, you have a esophageal pressure on average of five centimeters of water, if you have zero pressure in the pleura. And in the most dependent part of the lung, you can have again five centimeters of water at expiration is esophageal pressure, because you have only one measurement, while you have a real 10 centimeters of water in the dependent part of the lung. So just to show you that the esophageal pressure does not represent the absolute level of pleural pressure. This is a very important concept. Other studies, this is an abstract, uh, which I think will be published soon from a matter group, compared the non-dependence to the dependence sensor and the esophageal pressure at end expiration at different peak level. Differently from our study, uh, they showed uh, that the esophageal pressure seems to be as uh, parallel to the level of pressure in the most dependent part of the lung. But so, just to show you that it's not really clear if the esophageal pressure really uh, uh, estimates the true pressure in the uh, pleural surface, and uh, if it is more uh, associated with non-dependent or dependent lung regions. 
This is just to show you an example. If you have a pleural pressure of minus five centimeters of water at end expiration, and at end inspiration in the pleural, minus two, for example. And you have a change in artery pressure from zero to eight. So the transpiratory pressure will be five at end expiration and will be 10 at end inspiration, okay? So the driving transpiratory pressure will be five centimeters of water. Now, imagine that you have the same condition. So you change the airway pressure again from zero to eight. But the absolute level of pleural pressure in this case is no more minus five, but is zero. So you have the same change here in uh, uh, pleural pressure, so zero to three, like from minus five to minus two. But the transpiratory pressure is completely different, is zero to five, even if the transpiratory pressure uh, the driving transparent pressure is the same. Just to show you that if the absolute level of pleural pressure changes, the transferring pressure, absolute transferring pressure measured by the esophageal pressure is not valid anymore. What is only valid is the driving pressure, so the difference between inspiration and expiration, but not the absolute pressure. So this is the concept here. The esophageal pressure, in my view, does not represent the absolute pleural pressure, but the changes in the esophageal pressure might represent the changes in driving transpiratory pressure. So another point is the interstitial transpiratory pressure. We measured, we did several papers with Professor Negrini in Varese on this issue because we were able to measure the pressure in the interstitium between the epithelium and the endothelium. And at expiration, usually, you see here, of course, the alveolar pressure is zero, and the pressure in the interstitium is very negative. Why is negative? Because the lymphatics drain the fluids from the interstitium in order to keep dry the interstitium of the lamp. And the pleural pressure is, for example, minus three. So the transformary pressure at expiration measured by the esophageal pressure is three. And the real transalveolar pressure, which is the main factor determining lung injury, is 10 centimeters of water. But look what happens when we go to inspiration, for example, 30 centimeters of water in the arteries. The, the esophageal pressure increases from minus three to six, for example, nine centimeters of water to inflate the chest wall. But the interstitial pressure, especially around the capillaries, decreases a lot because there is a, a stress, a tangential stress uh, um, around the capillaries and the, and the, and the, and the uh, epithelial side. So the interstitial pressure may be very, 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 very negative. And so the transformy pressure measured the esophageal pressure, the esophageal uh, pressure at inspiration in this case is 24. But the real interstitial transformy, uh, transalveolar pressure, so the pressure between alveolar and interstitium, may reach up to 86 centimeters of water. That's why high institute pressure may be extremely damaging the line. So just showing you that, so the pleural pressure does not represent the real transalveolar pressure in the line. The methods to estimate uh, the transformative pressure are different. The most uh, famous is the absolute pressure, transformative pressure proposed by Talmor. You see here an example. This is the transformative pressure at end expiration, which is in this case negative at this PEEP level. Then we increase progressively PEEP, and what happens is that the transformative pressure at end expiration progressively increases. So this is the absolute difference between airway pressure and esophageal pressure that I showed you before probably is not correct. Then there were other methods like the elastance derived method that you have a, a uh, you measure the uh, plateau pressure at end inspiration in the arteries and PEEP at end inspiration. In this case, the difference is 16 centimeters of water. You measure the difference in esophageal pressure in the inspiration and the expiration. In this case, it's 3 centimeters of water. And you can compute the transformative pressure at end inspiration, like plateau pressure, multiply the 
uh, ratio between the elastons of the lung and the elastons of the total respiratory system. In this case, uh, uh, you can compute 17 centimeters of water. So you have 22 centimeters of water at end inspiration, but the real transforming pressure at end inspiration should be 17 centimeters of water. However, if you measure the absolute difference between the arteries and the esophageal pressure, as recommended by Talmor, you see here that at end inspiration, you have 22 minus 20, so 2 centimeters of water, which is absolutely different as compared to 17 centimeters of water. So this is a major issue. So if you measure the absolute transforming pressure at end inspiration by the absolute difference between RE pressure and esophageal pressure, you can get completely different numbers as you, if you measure by other methods. And you can have also with other release derived methods. If you compare these methods, so from elastin method or release method, and the absolute uh, difference between RE pressure and esophageal pressure, as suggested by Talmon, as you can see here, we did not find any correlation. Any correlation. So whatever method you use uh, to estimate absolute transparent pressure, you get the numbers that you want, with a huge difference between methods, which is not good if you want to use this technique to optimize respiratory mechanics. So just a few slides to finish my talk. During spontaneous breathing, this is as, uh, data from Marcelo Amato, but we have also new data going to be published soon, exactly very similar experiments. And this is the play during spontaneous breathing. This is the pleural pressure swing during inspiration in the non-dependent of the lung. This is not controlled mechanic ventilation, as I showed you before in my previous study. This is during assisted ventilation. We did that very similar study with PET, uh, looking at the ventilator-induced lung injury. It will be released uh, very soon. And uh, this is the pleural pressure in the dependent part of the lung. You see here that the pleural pressure, really measured by wafers, by pressure transducers, is much higher in the most dependent part of the lung. Then we can discuss if it is able to open up or recruit the lung or not. But just to show you that you have a huge difference in the pressure swing in the upper part and in the lower part during assisted ventilation. And this is the pleural uh, pressure. You see here that if you measure pleural pressure and you calculate the work of breathing, the pressure time product, the inspiratory effort that we are used to do, you see here you have a swing of at least 5 centimeters of water. In the most dependent part of the lung, you have a swing of 10 centimeters of water. So how can you expect that you measure esophageal pressure during assisted breathing? You believe that you are estimating your inspiratory effort. Really, the regional inspiratory effort in most dependent part of the lung is double as compared to what you are really measuring. And finally, do we need esophageal pressure to detect asynchronies? These are the most uh, 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 common asynchronies that you can find in your patients. And my feeling is that you don't need esophageal pressure to look at the asynchronies. For example, one of the most common, which is the ineffective effort, can be uh, easily detected just by looking at the RE pressure swings during expiration or by the flow swings during expiration without any need uh, of esophageal pressure. Finally, there are some conditions in which we really do not know if the esophageal pressure uh, is a, a real, uh, uh, maybe an accurate measurement. For example, when you have a chest tube or we have an additional nasogastric tube that now we prefer to use a nasogastric tube including uh, the balloons, when we have pleural effusion, for example, when we have one lung injury or in prone position, because in prone position you completely change the weight on the uh, uh, um, uh, esophageal balloon. So which is much more, much greater in supine position as compared to prone position. So at this point, how reliable is the measurement of the esophageal pressure? So to conclude, I think that the esophageal pressure and transforming pressure is a very attractive measure to uh, improve um, uh, and optimize uh, protecting mechanical ventilation. However, I show you that there are several technical difficulties that have to be solved. There's a sort of source of errors due to the elastins of the balloon, the esophagus, and the weight of the lung, so according to the positioning. The interstitial pressure, which is always not mentioned in most of the papers and not mentioned when people is talking about esophageal pressure, which is very important, which is the real uh, transalveolar pressure, which is the term ventilator-induced lung injury. The validity of the absolute value is uh, uh, 
uh, currently to be challenged, as I show you. So in my opinion, esophageal pressure does not give you any information about the absolute value of transplanary pressure. So my conclusion here is please do not target PIP on the absolute level of transplanary pressure, especially at end respiration. We can discuss later. Esophageal pressure is not really needed to detect patient ventilator asynchronous, and there are several conditions which may impair interpretation of that. So I think, and I don't recommend, but this is just my opinion, open for discussion, to routinely use actually esophageal pressure and transplanary pressure to optimize mechanical ventilation in our patients before we have more clinical and experimental data confirming that this technique may be really helpful uh, to improve outcome in our patients. The difference between science and physician and magic is that magicians usually know what they are doing. Uh, we sometimes, we are not so sure. Thank you very much.